Today, we're going to drill a little bit further down into the, the comps and appraisals section. We really are talking solely about comps and appraisals today. What service are they looking for from you when you're coming over there to help them list their property? What do you think the top one, two, three answers might be in this situation? They want to know how much the house is worth. There you go. That's a great one, Liz. And Nancy said guidance. Uh, Ella Marie said uh, sale price. And then Chandra said list price. So um, great, uh, <laughs> great continuity there, because really that's what we're looking at today, right? Is, uh, is being able to help price the home competitively. Now you'll look right above that, just barely, barely uh, 1% more help sell the home within a specific time frame, which really ties into uh, the pricing the home competitively, right? Number one and two are kind of 1A and 1B, really, um, if you think about it. So great answers from everybody there. That's exactly right. Um, they're looking for you to guide them through the process and more importantly, help them price that home and, and figure out what to do. We are going to look at today how to help price that home competitively, right? And really, we're also going to say, <laughs> this is just kind of get us, get us engaged a little bit. You stated the home was priced to sell. 217 days on the market have determined that was a lie. We want to avoid that. And so this class is going to help us avoid those days on market. Today's market, you might not have to worry about it quite as much, but there will be a time where you know we really want to hone in on uh, tighter time frames and tighter price ranges for um, the client. And then the last one here. Zillow uh, said your home was worth what? Hey, Zillow said my home's worth whatever the price is. We'll look at uh, an actual example of what Zillow, Realtor, Redfin, all of those online valuations, what they actually priced a home at online and what it actually sold for. You'll see uh, the, the varying differences of what that is. That way, next time your friend or family or anybody says something about the Zillow uh, estimate or any one of those online estimates, you can at least say, let, let me come price your property for you. That's, that's going to be the best way. So today we're going to look at uh, finding the best comparable property, right? Uh, there's a lot that goes into that, but the way we're going to break it down is we're going to have the comparable search. Uh, we're going to have analyzing pictures and then the appraisal process. Number one item is the comparable search. So the subject property, right? That's obviously um, the property we are going to be called to. There's going to be someone who says, raises their hand and chats with us uh, and says, hey, can you please provide a value? I'm thinking about listing my property. Uh, and we talk about in that Ignite Your Listing Agent um, videos, how to talk to people about selling and what you might say to get that ball rolling. But all of us will have people that say, I'm thinking about selling. And then your next uh, discussion tip is, well, let me help you with that. And I'm happy to stop by and give you a price on the property, right? So that's kind of to get the ball rolling. But what we're really going to talk about is starting with that subject property, right? We want to know that property so that we can find comparables that are comparable to that property. So we have to know what that property is, what it looks like, the ways to do that. The easiest thing to do is to be able to find it in MLS if there was a previous listing. So not all properties do that. Um, I completely understand that. But if there were previous listings for that property, that is going to be uh, the best place to find that. Uh, number two is the tax records. Um, and so we'll look at how to do that because not every sale um, in a neighborhood or wherever is in the MLS, right? Um, a lot of times it happen, happens off market, um, but it should <laughs> all be on the tax records. So we'll look at how to find that. Uh, and then the last one is, you know, is pretty easy, right? In person. Um, if we can get in that property before we go to that listing appointment, either we know the person, we've been in the property before, um, we know the neighborhood, maybe we've been in another home and they're all uh, fairly similar. Um, somehow, maybe we have firsthand knowledge of that property. So those are kind of the three ways to think about when someone says, let's think about a price for my property, MLS number one, tax records number two, and in-person number three. So for the MLS, uh, where would you go in MLS either Georgia MLS or FMLS, where would you go to be able to research if this property has been in there before? What program inside of FMLS? Cloud CMA. Cloud CMA. What about if you're just searching for properties, like you're just starting off the actual search? I see a couple in the chat box. Matrix. Yep, in the matrix. Now, you may have seen this week, they have renamed a section of matrix. It's, it's, it's still technically matrix, but the consumer side of it is called One Home. 
So I put it both, I put those both on here just so if you see it, there was a slight changeover. We won't go into that in this class because uh, you'll want to read that section of, of FMLS. All right, what about Georgia MLS? What's the program there? Lori said Paragon. And that's right. They also have one called Connect MLS. Those are the names when you go in, that's where we're going to start, right? So we're going to use that for the FMLS and Georgia MLS. What to look for in the MLS initially? Well, we just talked about it. Has the property ever been in MLS? And if yes, that is a huge benefit, right? We're going to be able to see um, hopefully pictures. We're going to be able to see the listing description, you know, things maybe that were replaced, uh, maybe HVAC units, roof, whatever. And so that's going to help us figure out, okay, this is the subject property and this is what picture I'm painting in my head of this uh, property today, because all I see are, you know, two or three or five or 10 year old pictures in the MLS and information. So you still have to use a little bit of filtering. Um, so we're going to look at the pricing history. Uh, we're also going to look at this real AVM, which is on the tax tab. And I'll show you where to find that if you haven't seen it before. And that's an automated valuation model, similar in, in, in concept to the Zestimate, um, but it's supposed to take into a lot more account from the real estate side. So we'll look at that. Uh, and then the neighborhood area search. So uh, if it's in a neighborhood, great. You probably have a lot of good comps and a lot of similar properties. If it's in an area, you may not. You may have a two acre tract of, of land with a 2000 square foot house. And then you may have a, a 10 acre tract of land um, you know, with a 5,000 square foot house. And so how do you compare those? We'll look at that today. Um, and then if it's not in the MLS, where do you start? So we'll look at that too. Now, if it's in the MLS, uh, FMLS, and that's where we're going to guide everything from today. I know uh, some people do use Georgia MLS, but it's similar in concept. If you use Georgia MLS a lot, you'll see, oh yeah, that's where I go in, in there. Essentially, we're going to go to search. We're going to type it in and see if there is any history uh, for that property. And if there is, it's going to pop up and look similar to this, right? There will be um, sale history from the public records, mortgage history, and the listing history of that property. And you'll see uh, it's blurred out just for privacy on this one, but MLS numbers there, you can click on that and it's going to bring up that old listing. And that's the, that's the page that you're going to want to read all of the information about that listing from. Make yourself some notes, um, print it out, you know, do whatever you need to do to be able to have that information. So that's if it were in the MLS previously. If not, then we're going to have to go to Matrix and do our search, right? Which is what we are probably used to doing anyway. Um, and we'll, we'll have to do this at some point anyway, if, even if it were in the MLS, but the MLS listing previous is going to give us a great head start. If you have a subdivision, that's number 1A. That's the best place to start because it's the tightest range of, of properties, right? Uh, that's where an appraiser is also going to start. And so if you know the, the subdivision or the complex or uh, whatever it is for that property, start there. That's going to be your best place. And 1B, so the next best spot, if you don't have the property uh, neighborhood or, 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 any, or a subdivision name, uh, is the map search. And what we really want to do there is think about starting in the tightest, tightest range possible. So 0.25 is the smallest you can go. And then you can go 0.5 mile and then one mile. And so that's how we'll do it. That's what we're gonna talk about today. Uh, we don't wanna start with 300 comps. We wanna start with two. And then if we need to expand out the four, then that's what we'll do. But we don't wanna start really, really large and have all this information that we have to process through. Um, so we'll talk about that. And then the uh, number two here is press the select all button, right? We want to get all of the data. And so that's where that button is right there. Even pendings, holds, withdrawals, expires, all of that. Um, you can always come back to this screen on the criteria section and delete out some of those if you get too many results. But we want to really see what's happening uh, in that neighborhood and in that area. Say we, we put our information in there and we found 25 matches, we press results and boom, there are our matches, right? That's going to give us that great starting point that we were talking about. And we'll go a little bit more in depth in that. We just want to go over some high level things right here. So what tax platform are we going to find? Where are the tax records? What's the easiest way for you um, to be able to get to that? And one of the ways you can get there is inside of your FMLS uh, account under the tax tab. So you can see here, we're under the tax tab. And then you're going to see over there to the far right, it's going to say realist tax. And so what that does is it's going to pull the county tax records. It's going to make it a little bit easier for you to do because you won't have to go to an outside source to the county records uh, website to be able to do that. Everything's going to pull right there. You can also do it in a Google search and just put the county name property tax records. This is what that's going to look like. 
Um, if you put Fulton County, Cobb County, um, Henry County, Forsyth County, anything that you're looking at, it will pull up a website. And typically it's gonna be named uh, similar to um, Q Public. So you can see up here in the top left of this screen, you don't have to remember the website address because you can just go search for it. Uh, but if you did Cobb County tax records, this is gonna be the site that you wanna go to. And then you'll see, you can search by owner name, location address, or parcel. This is a good place to match up. And the great thing that I just saw um, not too long ago is right here at the bottom. Uh, when you're on the page, you know, for that, uh, that property, you can scroll down to the bottom and see uh, qualified sales within a date range, and you can search by neighborhood um, or within a certain distance. And it actually goes down to like 1500 feet, which is a really tight uh, window, you know, based on what we were talking about. So you can get pretty granular here in looking up the tax records and looking up the, the comps uh, and where those are. You know, definitely use this as an avenue and use the MLS because you'll want to compare that. If there were a comp that your seller knows about when you get to the listing appointment, that wasn't in MLS, um, but you could have found it on tax records, you're going to feel like oh, I should have done a little more homework on this. So there are two spots, the MLS and the tax records are going to be where you want to start. Also, you can see in the top right sketch of that property. And so you can see if you go out to the property, did things change? Were there an addition, any additions on that property or whatever? Uh, but you'll at least be able to start with this and it breaks it down for the main area, the deck, garage, that's a good place to, um, to go as well. Also has the tax information there, um, the actual tax uh, notices for assessment that you can download and take a look at. So maybe you're looking at a listing three years old for this property, you wanna see what the tax taxes are for that property you know, currently, then you'll be able to go there. What do you wanna print when you're looking at the subject property for you to make your notes? My recommendation is the tax record, any previous listings, and then we'll get to the best comps. And the reason is, is because you're going to want to make notes on here. You're going to want to compare from the tax records back to the MLS, what properties were where, and did anything pop up on those tax records that uh, did not pop up on the MLS records. So to wrap up our subject property, uh, we want to assemble as much information as possible, bed, bath, square footage, acreage. We want to check the MLS and the tax records. Um, we'll get into this in a second, the view portion of it, uh, being able to use Google Maps and, and Google World History to look at the property. Um, and then we obviously want to drive through the area if we haven't been there, drive by the property if we haven't before, just see what's going on e either in the neighborhood or the area. Um, what is it back up to, a park? Um, is it close to the school system? Whatever those type things are. And then any amenities. We're about to jump into the actual comparables for that subject. What are the comparables? Well, this is the uh, actual definition, right? It's used in valuations to determine um, similar assets. Uh, you can read all these diff different definitions online, but uh, this is one from Investopedia uh, to determine the fair market value of the home, right? And really, if you think about what we do as real estate agents, um, it's not the job that the appraiser is going to do, right? Um, the, the, the thing that we are trying to do is look at what's happening in the market right now and what should we help uh, how should we help guide the seller in pricing their property? And the appraiser is looking at a snapshot on the day that they're doing the appraisal, what's happening in the market up to that point, and then what is their opinion of that value? So uh, although there are a lot of overlapping similarities uh, between you know, what we want to do and what the appraisers will, will come out and do, um, there are some differences in how we're going to look at it because we're looking at it today. The appraisal may not happen for 45 days from now. Or, or longer, right? Depending on when we go to market, when it goes under contract. So where can we find comparables? Anyone want to take a guess? FMLS, yes. Elementary. Georgia MLS. So. Georgia MLS. Tax records. Tax records, that's right. So essentially the same place. Uh, we already talked about the MLS, right? We talked about the tax records. And now if you have a property that's newer, um, then you also uh, may look in the new construction uh, side of things. And that's really going to be either in the MLS if they had a listing in the MLS. And if they didn't, you'll be able to use a website like this, which is called newhomesource.com. Um, and so that will give you some comparisons there. Um, you really can't use this, you know, new construction if it's a, you know, 5, 10, 20 year old property. But if it's a couple years old, you may be able to use new home uh, source to uh, find some new construction comparables, right? You obviously have to be in a, in a tight uh, window there from when that property was built, your subject property. But that's one that you may not think about right off the top um, if you have a newer home you're, you're looking at. 
So the goals for our research, when we're looking up the comparables, we want to have at least three sold if at all possible. Um, you know, one sold if we had to, it, after all the stuff we do that we'll look at today, if we only have one, we'll have to go with it. But we would love to have three solds, one active and at least one pending because the, the solds, that's what's happened, right? Even if it were yesterday or today at close, the active is what's happening, you know, right now, uh, competition wise for what you may be going to market with. And the pending is kind of what, what's happened recently and what's still happening now, right? Let's look at the FMLS and a little bit tighter breakdown on, on what this screen really tells us. Um, and we're going to divide it into a little bit more of sections. So you can see the, the first section there is about the property and the status. The second is the location. Um, the third is uh, the, are the details about bed and bath. Make sure that you include the items in number four and below, uh, which really are about the master on main, what uh, side of the house is made of, you know, brick, um, that type of thing. And so you really want to dive into that because that's really going to help that tighter window happen for your comparable search, okay? If you just go three, two uh, bedrooms with a one mile radius in a zip code, you're going to have so many results, it's going to be overwhelming for you to review. Um, and don't forget about this piece. Michelle Velchek actually went over this in one of her um, investor classes recently, is there's an additional fields um, section on your FMLS that you can add or remove whatever you want. And so look at this one. You can actually do pool features, accessibility, dock, showing instructions, whatever you want. There's, uh, I think, I don't know, between eight and 20 different items that you can choose from on there. And so if you're if your comparable property, if your subject property has a pool and, and you want to find comparable properties that have a pool, then you're going to want to go in here and choose, um, you know, you might choose not none. And so that it does come back with anything with a pool. Or if you have a specific pool that you want to compare against, you can search for that. So um, use this to your advantage. You can essentially uh, add it to your FMLS matrix search page and then save it as, um, as a template, save it as a standard so that it's always there when you scroll down to the bottom and you'll just be able to choose those items. But that, that way, again, it kind of tightens down how many comparables you're gonna come back with on that, on that search result because a lot of agents uh, get overwhelmed when they see you know, 45 properties they have to go through one by one to see if it's a comparable. That's a waste of your time really um, because what we wanna do again is start as tight as possible and then if we gotta grow it out, then that's what we'll do. Lori said, in today's market, how many months back do you suggest um, for comps? The way that, uh, you know, kind of in the flow of everything is the tightest window possible. So 30 days or less, if you get some results, great. And it's it's so dependent on uh, the, the property you're, you're researching that there's really not a broad answer. But the answer is start as small as possible, you know, 30 days then go to 60 days if you if you need more property results and then go 90 all the way out to one year. That's really the answer. The thing you really want to think about is staying as tight of a, an area as possible, right? So uh, if the property is right here, uh, you want to go next door neighbor, next door neighbor on this side, next door neighbor, next, you know, and, and stay as tight of a window on that subject property. You can go back further in time What we're going to do is uh, find best practices for uh, finding those comparables. And this is what also an appraiser will do called bracketing. Well, what that essentially means is, is this right here. We'll, we'll look at some examples. So say um, you're looking at bedroom comparables. What do you type in the search box to be able to compare, uh, find certain comparables for your, your property, right? Well, if you think about plus one, minus one. So if our property that we're going out, our friend said, come list uh, my property or come give me a listing presentation and help me uh, guide me towards a price. If that subject property has four bedrooms, then we're going to want to go on one side of four and the other side of four. So three to five, right? You could go exactly the number of bedrooms, exactly the number of bath in, in your uh, search criteria, but you're probably gonna find that bracketing helps a little bit. And then if you needed to still drill down further, then you can come back and, and go specific on that number. I would recommend starting here. So subject property has four and that will find every three, four and five bedroom property. Then we're gonna look at bathrooms, same thing. Um, we're gonna do, you know, if it has two full baths, it might say two and a half, whatever, just bracket that, bracket that full bath number, one to three. Acreage, a little bit trickier. Um, you can, the recommendation would be to start 
Uh, if your subject property has half an acre, um, go quarter an acre to three quarters of an acre up to, you know, up to one if you need to, um, just depending on the results. All of the, the results you see on Matrix are real time. So everything you plug in here, you'll see. All right, I started out with 40 uh, comparables. As you put this information in, it's going to drop to 30, then 20, and then, you know, 10, 15, wherever, somewhere in there. Year built, same thing, bracket. If it was uh, was built in 2005, you might put a bracket on there from 2000 to 2010. So, you know, five years roughly on there. For the subdivision neighborhood, again, we want to stay in that neighborhood um, unless there are two homes in the neighborhood and you just can't stay in there because the other home never sold. So if no neighborhood, again, that's where our baseline comes in as tight of a distance as possible, quarter mile, half mile, one mile, and then the, the kind of wild card there is if you needed to go out far out further than that, stay within the elementary school uh, boundaries for that subject. So that subject's in Roswell North Elementary School, then search for your comparables in Roswell North Elementary School if you had to get further and further out because of the comps, you just weren't finding enough comps, right? Stay in the elementary school because it's a tighter window and then the high school, right? The high school is typically bigger uh, area and the elementary school is a little bit tighter. Um, and and kind of that's if you had to get there. For the basement, you can say um, has basement, does not have basement. I, I wouldn't get so specific if your subject property has um, an unfinished basement that you wouldn't also look for any home with a basement, right? Some people may say, well, ours is unfinished. Let's look for only unfinished basements. You probably just want to search for when you go in your matrix, you can make multiple selections, finished, unfinished, partial. You may just want to select all of those in your initial initial search um, if you're doing the basement comparison. Obviously, if it doesn't have a basement, your subject, try to search for not basement. Um, that's a difficult one to comp out if there are other comps there, uh, you know, that do or don't have a basement. So, so make sure that criteria happens for you. Um, and again, if no results, you can remove those criteria. But take a look at this, you know, pyramid here, because really th this is a good visual of how we want to start. You know, the top of the pyramid is obviously smaller. And so we want to start with the smallest amount of comps possible. That's why we drill down on this uh, MLS search results, because if we have five, then they should be re five really good comparables for our property. Um, if we have one, then it's probably going to be the best comparable, but then we're going to need to go down to that second level of a pyramid and open it up a little bit more. So, you know, you may start uh, in that one, you may start with distance, right? So you, you, maybe you had to do a quarter mile, you might go out a half a mile. Now let's see, let's keep all the other criteria the same, but go out a little further, right? And you might use that as your, as your, as your button to go further and further out. Um, if you had to go, then you can go acreage because it, you really want to think about what an appraiser is going to be able to adjust for because we can price the property for a million bucks but if the appraiser says it's worth four hundred thousand based on all the comparables right beside it that's what it's going to appraise for right and so really we always have to kind of keep that in the back of our mind um, is we're not only doing this just for market purposes and, and what the seller wants but we want to also um, try to prep them for that appraisal some additional criteria you can look for, like if you had, say, 15 results came back on that search we just did. Well, you could look at, you know, one to two car garage versus three plus. If, you're, if your comparable has a three car garage, then you're going to want to search for that in your um, uh, subject searches if you have so many extra results, you know what I mean? And so these are kind of the additional steps to, to narrow it down. Um, Cul-de-sac or not, you're going to have to look at the map to figure that out. Uh, sometimes it's on the listing, sometimes it's not. Pool versus no pool, brick and no brick. Um, is it close to the road or what is it back up to? And then the systems age, you'll really only know by being able to look in the listing itself and see if the property disclosure is uploaded for, uh, you know, a previous listing. But if you, that, that's kind of getting really, really, really tight on being able to get to that comp. The view and the location, we're about to jump into this. You know, I know we've all been to Google Maps, right? And, or, or Apple Maps or whatever you like to use. And you've looked at your property or the subject property. You can see it in Matrix, right? When you click the address link, it shows you the satellite view of the property. That's a great place to, to start when you're looking for, um, you know, different things in the property, where it backs up to, is there a landfill nearby, all these, these great things, right? Take a look at this. This is what the actual historical maps can show you. Um, in, inside of this uh, Google Maps thing. So this was uh, back in 08. So we obviously had quite the drought there that, that, that made this happen. But this is the same map uh, on Google Earth from 08 
uh, to 2019. And so you can see, like, if you were listing this property and, you know, or 20, 2019 and you were back in here, you're like, hey, this is great, you know, great water access um, to the lake. And if you look in here, you know, back in 2008, that's, that's a pretty rough area um, that, that was, you know, deeply impacted. Now, it was a serious drought. You know, there was a lot of issues um, with that part of it. But the, the thing that this shows you uh, is that it can happen, right, in, in, in these listings. And so it's always good to have more information than less. Uh, but if the seller's like, oh, yeah, you know, it, it's drought proof, <laughs> you can always pull up things like this on uh, Google Earth. The one caveat there is that you have to download this. You cannot just go to the website um, and, and access it. Um, the historical maps, you actually have to download the program to get to. So the next thing we'll look at is uh, also within Google uh, Earth. Um, it allows you to do things like this, which is a little more detailed than if you just went to the 3D section on the web platform. So again, this is on that same lake, you know, Lake Lanier. We're just looking at um, what a view might be from, you know, this property. Say this were our subject property and it says, yes, it goes onto the lake. Well, what do they see, you know, when they get there, right? We can all look at the, at the 2D, you know, satellite maps, but this gives you a little bit better view. And this would be maybe one you'd show your uh, your, your seller and your buyer, right? Like if you had a buyer looking on the lake, hey, this is kind of the view from, from this area or from this vantage point. And you can move this thing however you want. You can go really flat um, all the way up to, to, to really high. So the last thing I'll show you on this one, uh, which, which might be a little bit creepy, is if somebody really cares about the, uh, uh, the sunlight and, and how the sunlight hits what side of the house or wherever, we can, we can all you know, bring a compass out there and say, well, the sun rises here and it, and it sets there. But take a look at this. They actually have a, um, a uh, section on here that you can see and pick out any property you want to. And it shows like the sunrise and the sunset and you can make it roll, go for as many days as you want to and see, you know, wintertime, this is where the sun sets, you know, this is how it affects the property. And uh, again, I just wanted you to know that that's in there just in case you ever have that seller who uh, really wants to see that or buyer. You might use it for buyers as well. We're going to take a, um, a deep dive in the CMAs and uh, reports. If we want to get it narrowed down to a range for our sellers, um, this is the homework we have to do, right? Which is really not that, that much. When you see it all and you say, this is what I have to do, start with MLS, find previous listings if possible. If not, let me go start the search. And then that's really, you know, the, the bread and butter of it. But, th but this is the part that separates a lot of listing agents um, from, from good to great listing agents is because you're able to take all of this data and make it simple for your seller to understand. And so that's why we're reviewing it today. From the MLS, we're going to, again, take a look at the um, cloud CMA portion um, and some other reports. Uh, but that's where we're going to go again, right? We're talking about the maps. We're talking about the subdivisions. If we need to go to that map, that's where we go. We type in the address of the subject property and the distance. We hit select all. Then we're going to do our bracketing, right? Um, on this one, we did three plus, two plus. Um, you can do that. You can do bracketing, whatever you want to do. You can also put in a price range. If you know approximately this house is worth somewhere around 400,000, if you wanted to keep your results down, you could go 300 to 500 or 200 to 700, whatever you wanted to do. Again, we're just trying to get um, you know, 10, 15, 20 properties at the most that we start with, and then we can drill down from there. And so you'll see in this you know, very generic search result, we found 16 properties. And so look at this. We went from 440,000 all the way up to 1.5. That's too big of a range, right? Our property is not going to be somewhere. It may be somewhere in the middle of there, but uh, that's not going to be great comps for you to, to, to worry about. So then in this scenario, we went back and we just said zero to 700. That's the bracket for the pricing. Maybe it's somewhere uh, in the middle there. And we got 11 matches. So five of those above 700 got put off or taken off. Uh, and now we're going to go look at these properties. So now we have some sold properties, a couple of pendings, and one under contract, one active under contract and two pendings, essentially the same thing. Um, so this is the properties we're looking at. And uh, if you didn't know this piece, uh, over in your agent uh, display, you can click that button down and actually see a, uh, what's the portal side by side. So it shows a little bit of info about the property and then the pictures. And if you clicked on that, you can scroll through the pictures. Um, if you click on the listing, obviously it'll take you to the listing, but you use this however you want. If you like the um, single line display like this, that's a good spot to start from. You can also add in a few different columns. Like if you find yourself using um, certain columns, the ones I like, 
I, I can't remember which one defaults here and which one doesn't, but I don't think current price per square foot defaults. So I added it and then I just saved it as a template. And then if you scrolled all the way out to the right, I don't have enough screen here to show you, but I actually broke it out by, uh, you know, main floor bedrooms, second floor bedrooms, all of that, just so that it's all here. And then you can always download this as an Excel spreadsheet and just take a look at it. If, you, if you're the type of person who likes to print and draw on the things and circle and highlight, then this is gonna be a, a really good option for you. Um, but at least you have that data. And again, you can see it there. So make, make your MLS search uh, matrix home screen how you want it and really set yourself up for that next listing too, right? So you don't have to repetitively look for that. So we found our results. Uh, we're, we're, we're looking at the information. We, we started with 16. And so now we're trying to hone that down, right? We want to get, again, at least three solds, um, you know, a pending and an active if we possibly can. We're going to go through all of these pictures. We're not, we're not going through these pictures today, uh, as a group, but that's what you would do, right? You would say, okay, I know my subject property. I know uh, about what's updated in there, what's been updated the last few years. If you don't know that information, we have it in our Ignite Your Listing Agents uh, uh, video series. Um, so what you'll do there is, is do what? How would you find out if that home's been updated? So let's say you're not going to the property yet to see it. How would you know what's been updated in that property and what hasn't if you don't have an MLS listing and you yourself haven't been in there, what would you do? You ask the seller. You ask the seller. That's right, Greta. And so, you know, we talk about in that uh, listing series, what to say, um, and it's essentially a pre-listing appointment. You know, tell me about any updates you've made. Um, if there's anything you could change in the property, what would that be and why? Uh, because, you know, that's another, another side is we want to know what's updated, but we also want to know what's not been updated and what's kind of been sitting there for a while. You know, maybe it's 10 years old, um, uh, that needed to be replaced 10 years ago. And so, so now we know that. Now we can at least try to paint a picture in our head uh, before we, we've gone out there. So again, what's updated, what's not updated. Um, this is another scenario where my recommendation is to have a, a sheet of paper and you're writing out, okay, this is a great comparable. This one has an updated bath, a new uh, HVAC and the minus, you know, for this property is it backs up to the highway. The minus is this roof is 35 years old because when you're going back in and doing your comparables with uh, your comparison search with your subject, you'll want to remember those notes. And it's going to be hard once you get, you know, four, five, six properties in there um, to do that. So you can see the second one, you know, it's brick all sides, new quartz in the kitchen. The negative for this one is the appliances are old and the deck needs to be replaced. All of those things you can see from the pictures, right? Um, and so that's, or, and or the description or the seller's property disclosure that's on that listing. So there's a lot of information that's there that the public can't access. And so that's, uh, where, you know, you step in or, and are able to get that. Ultimately, what we want to do is uh, get all of that down to a range. We talked earlier about the question, uh, you know, do you give your seller, uh, your potential seller, a specific price, $371,000 we should go to market for, or you do, do you give a range? Uh, and my advice in this is to give a range. Um, and we'll look at the pros uh, of that. And so maybe your comparable search, we went through all those uh, comparisons there and we found it's somewhere in the 330 to 370 range. So let's just say that for example, well, um, you know, there's 330, there's 350 right in the middle, there's 370. Level of updates and features obviously increases with the price. Um, and then you can more directly compare it. You might be able to get even a tighter range of dollars if you uh, have seen the property or if you have pictures. But really what we're trying to get down to is a pricing decision. Uh, we want buy-in from the seller. Um, this also tells you a lot of the, when you bring up these initial ranges of, of properties, um, you know, you're able to decide with the seller, the seller's able to decide how aggressive they want to be on the pricing. If they go lower in the range, obviously it's going to be off the market in, in no time. It might be off the market in no time in the high range in this market, but you know, just in general, if we're thinking about a balanced market, and then if you price a little bit higher in the range, it might sit on the market a little bit. Here's a comp that did that, right? This comp right here was priced a little bit higher. It sat 10 days. This home right here that was priced a little bit lower, it was gone in four hours, right? And there were hundred offers or whatever, and it actually went above list price. And you can at least show them that, that data, right? But they're choosing the actual price um, because you, you, know, you both wanna be in on this decision. After the walkthrough, you might find out that you can narrow that price range a little bit more. Maybe you say, okay, I didn't know you had new carpet, 
new countertop. Well, that's a little more like this other one that I was looking at right here on my notes. So we could probably go in the 345 to 365 range. You could stay in that 330 to set 370 if you don't happen to just know that right off the top of your head when you're with that seller. But if you did know that, you could give them a little bit of a tighter window um, and say, listen, this is a, a, going to be a great price range. Um, we might get multiple offers in the 345. We might get them in the 365, but this is what the comps are showing. And so, uh, you know, where would you like to price the home at? So seller decides, you know, you move on and, and have that listing uh, agreement signed. This is a good report to, uh, to have with you when you're doing your research. Um, it probably is also a, a report you're going to run at the very beginning. So you're doing your initial comparable searches in matrix. Um, you're also going to want to run, want to run the absorption report because this is really going to tell you for a neighborhood, uh, or for an area, how hot in this market, it's going to be a scale of hotness. Is it just regular hot or is it off the rails hot? You know, you're going to be able to find that out through this absorption report. Uh, and so what that would look like is right here inside of MLS, um, you're going to see reports, absorption analysis. And then when you open that up, it's going to look just like this. It's going to be very generic, uh, pretty easy to follow through, but you're going to go residential detached if that's what you're looking at. Um, and then you're going to come fill out a few pieces of information here. Number one being the subdivision name, put it in here if there is a subdivision name, uh, and then you'll run the report. That's all you have to put in here. Now, this is going to go default one month back, um, and we have a great video on our uh, YouTube channel about all of the details of this absorption report. Uh, but you're going to run that CMA, you know, get to the cloud CMA and then run this absorption report right here. SolidSourceChannel.com, we have this 18 minute video that breaks down every piece of it and how to run um, this absorption report. If you don't have the subdivision, again, you can go back up here to number two, the elementary school and find that and then run that report. And what it's going to do is show you a breakdown of price ranges for that subdivision or elementary school area, whichever one you, you were able to run there. Um, and then it's going to tell you how many days on market those properties have had, how much above list price those properties sold for or, or below, if that's uh, what's happening in that area. But at least you'll be able to take that with you and show that seller um, hey, this is what's happening in your neighborhood in this specific price range of, of these properties. But we're really thinking about what are we going to give to the seller all, out of all of that research we've done? We've done all this homework. What should we print out um, and or have digitally available when we do meet with that seller? Um, obviously, the cloud CMA, I would print uh, for the seller to leave with them. And I would also have it on my tablet, laptop, whatever you're, you're using there, because it can be interactive. Um, the tax records printed out. Sometimes sellers, uh, you know, homeowners didn't even know that you could just go print that out, you know, right from the tax uh, property records place. So, so print that out. Sometimes you'll find out that the person you're meeting with uh, may not be the person that's on, on the deed there on the tax record, or there's multiple people. And then that helps you understand that, hey, I actually need to be talking to two people here, um, not just one person about selling this property, because that other person is going to have to be involved at some point signing it over or also approving you know, you uh, listing that property. The absorption report, we just talked about, print that out, bring it with you. That's a great report to circle, highlight the sections for the seller. Uh, the Google map, again, that would be more of a digital thing you would bring with you. The listing agreement we talked about. Um, and then in our listing class, that's what we kind of talk about is having all of these, how to get it to your uh, seller before you actually meet with them. And then when you meet with them, bringing it again, uh, so that you can all go over it together. You just don't want it to be the first time they've seen any information about you um, when you're walking through their property. We've got a pop quiz coming up. From the arrow here, you can see this is our subject property. So say that's the property, the person called or contacted you and said, please uh, come out here and tell me uh, what my home's worth. I'm, I'm thinking about listing. So we're going to show a few properties right here. Take a look at the comps. C is next door. B is essentially across the street in the same subdivision. A is down the road a little bit. D is down the road a little bit. And E is across the street. What do you think the best comp is in this scenario? Overwhelmingly, uh, the answer is C. And yes, we're doing a very high level generic. Uh, if the property really is the same, it's in a neighborhood, so it probably is. And so C is that one. All right, what about this question? What is the worst comparable? Just based on distance and, and the, the map itself, we don't really know anything about all of these properties, you know, potentially yet. So we've got um, some A answers, D answers, and E answers. It looks like majority picked A as the, the potentially the worst comp. Does anyone who answered 
A want to tell me why why they think A is the worst comp? It's the furthest away. The furthest away. Okay. See, we had uh, actually quite a few pick the letter D. Why is D the worst uh, comp? It's across houseway and it's far away. It's across the street and far away. But because it's a neighborhood home, uh, the answer here really is D. Uh, really, it's kind of D and E because it's across the street, like Susan said. So an appraiser will try to stay on the same side of the street for comps as, as much as they can. It's far away and it's across the street. And so really, if you're thinking about this and these are the only homes that have sold, like say you take your map and you're like, you know, you did your bracketing and, and all of that stuff. And these are the only five homes that have sold that might be comparable to this one. You're obviously going to want to start with C, which we all said that. Uh, B would be next because it's still in the neighborhood. And then A would potentially be the next the next best comp. If you have to cross the street, that's where it really starts to break down because the appraisers really aren't typically going to do that unless they absolutely have to based on distance, right? So think about staying on the same side, really think about staying inside of that neighborhood. And then also, uh, if these were all on the MLS, I would make sure to run that tax record report to see if anything sold in here, not on MLS that was in the tax records, because that may be your third comp and you may not even need to think about going down here to letter A. All right, one more uh, quick one. So let's say our subject property, we've done the search results inside of Matrix. It's 3,100 square feet, five bed, three and a half bath, okay? I'm going to highlight a few uh, properties in here and let me know which colored box uh, that you would choose uh, as the actual comparable. See Is it, it the, the green one? The green? Yeah, the green's almost, green. um, almost right on it, right? Uh, 30, 173 yep. square feet, five, three and a half. Obviously, we want more than one comp, right? Uh, what would be the next comp that you would, you would select out of that? Yellow. Yellow. Yellow, Yellow is a good one. What about blue? Yes. Yeah, I mean, if, if you really think about it, you know, even the from the green to the top purple one up there, um, there's only a, a difference of a, a couple hundred square feet, right? Um, it, but the difference in the bed and bath, right, is is one full extra bedroom and that half bath moved into a full bath, right? Most of the comparison of bed and bath is between agents and, and buyers and sellers. It's not really in the appraisals. Uh, appraisers like mine, hey, if you have five bed versus six bed, your home is worth way more. It's a lot of it's based on that square footage. If two homes were finished the exact same and they had the same amount of square footage, one could still be a five bed, one could be a four bed. So think about that scenario when you when you kind of start to break that down, right? It just means that they put another bedroom into the same amount of square footage as the home next door. Uh, and so really what that means is all of those things can be adjusted out from the appraiser if you had to use these as comps. And these actually may be your five comps for that property, right? Like you may use all five of them. You'll just have to make some sort of um, deductions, you know, based on if the other one had larger square footage or a slight deduction based on the bed and bath if everything else were the same. The market changes, you'll have to look at the properties that you're looking at as you're comparing it, which one was sold, which one is pending and active to be able to find that number. Uh, but that's that's where you would start. This section is going to talk about analyzing pictures. So it's going to be very picture heavy. Uh, we're going to look at a lot of different um, comparable pictures and see what you notice when we look at these pictures so that when you're looking at it, you can say, okay, this house has this as a subject or as a comparable. How does it relate to the property that um, I'm trying to find a price for? If you're looking at property pictures, sometimes you can see a lot from those pictures. Sometimes, you know, they're a little bit deceiving. So we're going to take a look at some of these and think about it from the perspective of uh, as you're comparing the property that you're potentially going to list. Uh, what are you looking for in these pictures? So think about it as you are looking at the subject properties, you found the bracketing cr criteria and you've gotten to that point. And let me know what you see in this, in this picture that might be of value in this comparison properties when you're comparing it against your subject property. What are the things that jump out at you? Moldings. Okay, that's a good one. The hardwood floors. Floors. That's a good one. The coffered ceilings, the recessed lighting. There you go. Boom. I mean, I think that's probably the you know the majority um, of, of the of the big things you can see here. You can look a little bit on the left there. It looks like a you know glass French door, probably an in-home office. So hopefully you had more pictures to be able to confirm that were an office, but uh, you may be able to just tell from this one. Right, next picture. Fireplace. Yep. The bay window. Mm -hmm. I'd say open floor plan. 
Mm -hmm. That's a good one. Like Granite nice countertops. Card. Yeah, there you go. Somebody's starting to peek into the kitchen. You're also thinking about things of value that you can compare your property to, but you're also thinking about things that are in this property that might make a buyer buy this one versus yours or the opposite, right? So some of them aren't necessarily, you know, huge value additions, but they might be uh, big additions for a buyer um, to be able to want to buy this property. So if one's a little more updated or in trend, it might be a bigger buyer item and so that might affect the pricing based on that, if that makes sense. What do you see here? Stainless, Stainless steel appliances, mm -hmm. double ovens. Mm -hmm. Countertops seem to be um, upgraded. Mm -hmm. Yep. Granite countertops. You still have the engineered hardwood floors, you know, flowing through um, that area, the double ovens that you talked about, stainless steel appliances. It looks like, you know, not, not necessarily custom, but a little bit higher end cabinets maybe than you would find in, in maybe some of the comps, depending on what you're looking at there. All right, now we'll do a, a, a sample bathroom. So what about this one? The separate, separate, tub, separate shower. shower. Mm -hmm. More granite. Mm -hmm. Tile floor. Mm -hmm. Tiled shower. <laughs> yep. So you got the walk-in shower with the tile, the granite countertop, the oil rub, uh, bronze fixtures, you know, tile floor. So that's what we're looking at when we, when we are looking at these pictures. Um, because like I said, even if there's not a considerable value for these things, when we're talking to our potential seller, we want to let them know what's in these properties, right? So being able to identify some of that um, is key. This is all the same house, by the way, on, on, on this round. What about this room? This is actually a bonus room up upstairs, like in a finished attic, essentially. Can anyone tell the floor type just by the picture? Like laminate or LVP. That's it. Yeah. So being able to decipher that can help you too, right? When you're looking at it, you might say, Oh, it's like some hardwood floor type. And if it were only this room, it might not create that big of a difference in the home that you're looking at uh, to, to price out. But this is LVP. And you can see, you might not be able to see on the Zoom, but if you actually had the picture, you can see the seams right here. So you can see that they're a little bit wider than, you know, like a, a true hardwood might be. And then if you look across here, you almost see no seams. It's almost like one continuous sheet. And so there's a, a few, you know, a few things you can pick up on to see if this is LVP versus an engineered flooring versus a true, you know, what they might call a true hardwood flooring, the LVP uh, that we talked about there. All right, the backyard, anything there that you would notice for comparison purposes against your subject property? Flat that backyard. Mm -hmm. I think I heard, two, I heard two things there. I heard one flat backyard. Was there a second difference? I just said level. Okay, yeah. perfect. Yeah. What else? It looks private. Mm -hmm. uh, a patio. Mm -hmm. Covered patio. Yep. So you got the large flat backyard, you know, covered porch. And then, and yeah. One thing I noticed there, right, when you're just looking at the picture, and I mean, I know this property, so that's why uh, I know it's not fenced, but if, if you zoomed out or whatever, if you had a bigger picture, you could truly tell that it wasn't fenced on any side. And so that might be a, a, a downfall for this property as maybe as your subject property that you have, it is fenced. Maybe this one isn't, so there's some value there. If yours does not have a covered porch, but you know the pricing on this property with the covered porch, there may be some value there. Um, you know, And then there may be some more marketing value if this has a large backyard and the subject property that you have didn't, right? So all of those things are just things we're gonna look for. This is a whole new property. We're going to run through the same same situation on this one. What do you see in this? Two car garage. Mm -hmm. Big front, front porch. Front porch. Front yep. porch. Lots of parking. Yep. <laughs> There's a lot of concrete on this one. Anybody want to take a guess on the roof? Can you tell from the pictures? Dimensional shingles. What's another name for that one? Architectural. So cover front porch, carriage, house, garage doors, if you need to get specific about it. Board and batten siding. And then there's a star there because that was what we were going to bring up is uh, if you can if you can uh, just take a look at it from the roof. And the same thing really on this last uh, property we looked at. You know, this is a far away shot. There's much better pictures, obviously, that were in the MLS. Uh, but the same thing there was an architectural roof. Anything in this picture that you see, can anyone tell the flooring type um, or anything else that you think is of value here? If you also had maybe a newer home that was the subject property and you're looking at this one for a comparable. Open floor plan again. Yeah, that was a good one. Anything else? Yeah, you said the floor, the floor is either wood or engineered wood. Yeah, yeah. This is actually a high-end LVP as well on, on this one. High ceiling. Mm-hmm. Does anyone, um, when you're looking at this picture, how to, how, what about the staging? Does any, anyone like or dislike the staging? Virtually staged, maybe. Who said that? Susan? Susan. You have a good eye. It, yeah, this one was actually <laughs> virtually staged. So all of this is virtual. We talk about this in that listing class. If you want to know a little bit more about virtual staging, and this is kind of a side note into what we're talking about today, but yeah, it's, 
it's wild what they can do. Shadows, you can see like there's a little shadow underneath the, the sofa. This rug doesn't exist. Open floor pan, plan LVP, you know, stone stack fireplace uh, L with the uh, shiplap. And so now we're in the kitchen. Anything there that, um, you know, would be a value or, or comparison purposes potentially that you could tell from the picture? The hood, the oven hood. Yep. Eat in kitchen. Mm -hmm. On a tiled backsplash. Mm -hmm. Can anyone tell what type of countertop? this one is and then it's hard to tell uh, so i'm not one you know, is quartz good. and one is, is granite quartz? very good don which one which one is this the bar that's quartz and then the over there with the cooktop is uh granite yeah you nailed it yeah this is a big quartz um this is a, a, a granite you know uh piece two pieces back here so yeah you you nailed it y'all custom vent hood um it's got a farmhouse sink which is tough to see from this angle um and then you've got the drawer style microwave which again is kind of tough to see um, on, on this picture, but quartz countertop here, and then you got the granite back there. So uh, good work there. All right, this is the, the bathroom on this one. Anything in this that, that you would want to notice for comparison? Soaking tub, mm -hmm. uh, double floor, towel shower, double, double sink. Pass. Yeah, all of those things, right? Um, got a granite counters in there, the walk-in shower, the freestanding tub, the dark bronze fixtures, all of that that y'all just named. And what about this? This is kind of a unique feature. Sunroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a it's a you know it's a covered deck essentially, but these you know these panels all slide down into one, so it's mm -hmm. uh, a, a, you know custom sliding door wall, nano wall type type situation. Um, so that would be if this were a comparable property, and you were comparing it to the property you were going to price, um, this would be a, a substantial upgrade if yours did not have it. If this property sold. So you could, you know, you could um, designate, you know, some some dollars towards this being a feature that yours didn't have. So there's the outside, um, you know, covered rear porch with with the pine, you know, ceiling and everything. The large, you know, flat backyard. Last property that we have to look at today uh, in this section. So can anyone tell the roof shingle type just based on the pictures? Three tab. Yep. yep. Inside the house, um, anything you notice here? Real hardwood. Hard so this one, floor. this one, mm -hmm. if you if you take a, it does anyone else have a different opinion on the floor? Yeah, I don't think the engineer engineered. Yeah, yeah. It, you can, it's 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 Sorry, it could yeah. be a little tough to see, but if you can look right here where you can see the hand scrape, the, you know, mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, these this is a marking of traditionally more of an engineered flooring. Um, you know, engineered hardwoods. What about for a marketability standpoint? What about the paint? in this room better if it was more neutral yeah the appraisers uh will say that you know hey if there's a home that has fresh upgraded paint obviously that's some value you know fresh paint but it does need to be in a neutral you know tone or more of a buyer pleasing tone and that goes with the overall theme of the house right so uh, agreeable gray was the hot color for what five or ten years think about it from marketability and the appraiser will look at the overall general feel of the house if everything's updated and you have like a a, a nice color in the house there may be a little bit of value in there for the condition piece. We'll look at the form that the appraiser actually looks at, but definitely for marketability, right? All right, this kitchen. So your comparable prop, your subject property, and this is a comparison property. What are you noticing in this kitchen um, for value for your property or value for this property? Countertop. Yeah. What type of countertop is that one? Isn't it just laminate countertops. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else in this one? Is the flooring tile? Mm -hmm. It is. It's a slide in range and oh, oh my, microwave comparably. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've got, you know, a stainless steel uh, range and then the, the white uh, microwave. So uh, no, what, what about what, what's missing in this kitchen? Uh, maybe from an updated kitchen. An island. An island. Yeah. That's an island. Backsplash. Yeah, that was what I was looking for there, right? So that, that's got some value to it. You know, if your property has it, this one doesn't. If you notice at the very top of the picture, what else do you see there? The rest of the floor. Yeah. yeah, lighting. Yeah. Lighting. So, you know, if, you're, if your subject property is updated, this one sold, you know, for a certain price and your kitchen's updated in your, in your subject property, you're adding that value into your property based on this one selling at you know, 400, if your property is updated with the kitchen, then now you're starting to put, add those additions in for those different things, right? So you want to see what this one has, know what it sold for, and then be able to add into your property or the opposite. If we looked at that new construction property and that were top of the line and yours needed some updates, then now you're subtracting out, you know, some value for that, right? Um, and, and again, you're talking to your seller about this is what the best comparable shows. Your property is more updated or 
you know, needs a little more updating to get to this point. And so this is what we're going to look at with the price range. So we, we just talked about all of those things. Um, so in the in this bathroom, uh, we all know we can see here, you've got some wallpaper, you know, you've got a little bit of an older style sink. So in this powder room, if your powder room, you know, a little bit more updated, then you've got the value there. All right. So what about this bathroom, master bathroom here? Is that a vinyl flooring? It is. Good catch. Rust fixtures. Yep. yep. Outdated. Definitely. Yeah, definitely could do some updating, right? You got the light fixtures, mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the, um, the mirror, you know, doesn't really have any kind of definition. There's no frame or anything to it. You've got the outdated fixtures. Um, you've got the one piece, um, you know, countertop. The, the tub is a little bit outdated. The flooring is, you know, a, a, a laminate uh, roll, roll on vinyl. Um, you've got the, the shower over here with the brass, um, the paint color. Overall feel, if your property were similar, then you could be able to price similar. But if your property were more updated, now you're going to add those things. Again, if it were the opposite, then you'd, you'd do the opposite. But, but being able to recognize that. All right, so this is the basement in this house. Um, say you, you have that subject property and it has a basement. Um, you know, what are the things that you're looking at in this basement versus yours? Ooh, the drop ceilings. Yeah. It's drop finished. Ceilings. It is finished. Yeah. The floor. Yeah. The floor. yeah. Is that cement? Floor. This one is, yeah, this one's the, the, the they finished, you know, polished uh, the cement. This one has some okay. carpet down in here. It does have the drop ceiling. Um, and so definitely that's probably the, the biggest you know, value hit, uh, depending if your, if your subject property has a drywall ceiling, then you're going to definitely be able to add a lot more value into your subject property. And if your property has uh, more of a finished product on the floor, whether it's LVP or carpet or whatever they've done in the basement, um, you're going to be able to add some stuff in for that one too. So, um, you know, being able to recognize that's a, a good, uh, a good step for sure. All right. What about this backyard, um, back deck situation? Again, you're comparing it to your property that has, um, you know, a deck as well. Secluded in private. Mm -hmm. Nice deck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good size. Like it looks like it's a little worn though. Yes. Yeah, it does. Yeah, it's definitely a new <laughs> repairs. Um, you know, typically you start to see uh, any kind of mold on the top, then then the bottom uh, may may be in in some some issues too, right? Um, typically, it tells you there's age. Maybe it hasn't been kept up. Um, you know, is it is it code and things like that? So. Um, that's where, um, you know, you might find that. Let's kind of recap the properties we've looked at. So uh, the subject comparison quiz, you know, we talked about the differences, right, when we were looking at this property, but I mean, tremendous value difference. If this is your subject property on the left, and this is a comp, you know, that sold um, in that area, right, you're going to be able to add tremendous value, flooring to flooring, cabinets to cabinets, countertops to countertops, you know, work your way up from, from floor to ceiling, right? Um, appliances, you got the double oven versus the slide in, uh, you've got the top upper cabinets that are nice. You've got the backsplash that goes all the way. I think it stops right around here, but then you've got the designer colors with the trim work, right? So that's, if you can get that MLS listing from the property, you're about to go help price. This is what you would want to do, right? Just look at this one. Look at this one. Let me start from the bottom up and write down these differences and find out what this value really might be. Um, so now we're looking at these two, right? So now on the opposite side, this is our subject. And this is one of the comparables that just happens to be next door, not in a neighborhood, right? So now you're kind of comparing on the opposite side. They've got quartz, they've got the farmhouse sink, um, you know, the really nice custom uh, hood vent there. Um, you know, flooring, you might be equal, like say this home were a couple years old and this is a new LVP, there may not be a, a ton of difference there. Um, this one actually in the new construction does not have all of the trim work like this one has. So you can see kind of the crown molding that's here that's, that's not really here. And so that may be a little bit of value, might be a little bit of buyer preference um, depending. So, you know, it can work for and against you depending on the, on the property you're looking at. It all, it all is, uh, you know, variable um, to that. So we're actually at the appraisal section. So the appraisal process, right, can bring some anxiety. So this is kind of a long-standing joke. Uh, this is not one that I've made up, but you know, through the eyes of the seller, this is how they see their house. The buyer sees their house like this, and the appraiser sees the house like this, right? The same, the same property. Um, so kind of a joke. If any appraisers are on this call, I apologize for that one. That, that's not uh, any way to be slight at you. Let's look at this right here. Um, this is actually the national contract price, sales price that uh, above appraised value, right? So uh, you can take a look at this number. This light blue line is the actual home price index. And the um, uh, dark blue line is the percent of purchase transactions with the appraised value 
uh, below the contract price. So 20%, that's a pretty big number. That means people are paying a lot, right, for the properties. We know that. We know that in general. We know that across the United States, and this is a national number. Um, so, you know, sometimes we think uh, we, we get bogged down in, in trying to figure out, you know, down to the $5,000 range for our for our seller. Um, sometimes it, it really doesn't matter in, in, in different markets. We want to be as specific as possible as we possibly can and, and you know, as small of a range as possible. But uh, in, in this market. So price appreciation average, if you haven't seen this number, 15% uh, for the full 2021. Again, this is a national number. Um, obviously, local markets are different. Um, I think we've seen 19% in some pockets in the Atlanta metro, you know, 11%, but, you know, average in there for, for the whole area, uh, whole nation, 15%, which is up from the 2020 full year average of 6%. So tremendous, you know, 9% uh, difference there. We bring up that because one of the things that appraisers look for um, is the trend, right? Like what's happening in the marketplace? What's the trend of the area? What's the trend of pricing in the area? Is it trending up? Is it staying flat? Is it going down? Well, most areas right now, uh, for at least for the past you know, six months to a year and a half, we're going extreme up. Maybe now there's starting to be a slight you know, leveling off. Maybe interest rates are ticking up a little bit. Inventory uh, maybe is coming back in some pockets with some new construction, but again, it's all specific to that area. Uh, there is a chart here uh, that talks about the different types of ways to value a property, right? You've got the appraisal report all the way here, a CMA, um, you know, that we provide for our clients right here. Um, you've got the automated uh, valuation model that we talked about. That's that computer generated. That's the um, the, 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 the Zillow's estimates way down here, it's, it's even further to the right. This one is more of the one you would find on the tax tab in your MLS uh, search criteria. So when you go to matrix and you hit the tax tab, you'll see it says real AVM or price range, like right below it. If you had zero idea of what that home might sell for in today's market and you were just starting your research, you might check that out. And if it says, you know, 500, then at least that gives you a ballpark idea of maybe four to 600, right? Hopefully. Um, but it also has a range there. And then, then you'll start to be able to go dig for your comps. But that might give you a, a place to at least start to think about it. The way that those work, just so you know, is, is, is it's all computer generated, right? There's not someone sitting there just like when our clients tell us, hey, my estimate said this or that. Um, well, the, the, the thing I always like to say, <laughs> to say in regards to that is, uh, well, what if you had gold bars that lined all of your floor? Like that, your, all your flooring were nothing but gold bars, but it says your house is worth, you know, 375000 Well, obviously your house is worth way more than that if your floor is made out of gold bars. And so that was always my example is how do they know what's inside of your house and what upgrades you've done and all of those type things, like the quality of your house? Well, they don't. It's just a tax you know, how the square footage, let's take a little bit of land, let's take the comparable properties and what they've sold and apply it to that square footage of that property, right? It's a simple mathematic equation. Uh, it, they're not looking at, at the true value. They may happen to be close because a lot of times, you know, it's based on the bed and bath and, and square footage. But if the house is way, way upgraded or way, way not upgraded, you know, Zillow doesn't know that and they're still pricing it right there, you know, like it was either updated like the rest or not updated like the rest. So it's a neat, kind of an easy scenario to point back at somebody if they say, no, this is what it says that we should price it at. That's not it. We're going to use the CMA and then the appraiser is going to be the ultimate one here, right? Which is why they, they are at the, the very beginning of this list. What is an actual appraisal? Uh, uh, an actual appraisal report. It's an opinion of value developed by a licensed appraiser, right? And it's an it's supposed to be, and, and it is an unbiased, independent, objective, impartial, impartial, credible, and reliable opinion of value. So this is the source, regardless of where we come up with our comps, regardless of where the seller thinks it should be priced at. Uh, when the appraiser comes in there, if there is an appraisal being done that's dependent for that contract, this is what takes precedent over all of that. Now, in today's market, we're seeing a lot of appraisal gap coverages, a lot of escalation clauses that might shoot that right out of the moon, and the buyer says, I'm okay paying that difference. Um, and that's kind of a different scenario. It's not specifically what we're talking about today. Uh, but, you know, you should know that, right? And if you're representing buyers, you probably already know that. Um, but that's what that means. That's the true definition of their appraisal. And again, you've got down here at the bottom, this shows you the most comprehensive value, uh, value definition versus the least. Uh, comprehensive. So the least is down here with the automated valuation. 
and then a non-appraiser and then us uh, and then it jumps up to the to the actual appraiser all right if you've ever uh, wondered who orders the appraisal well it's the funding institution right the mortgage lender um, orders that and then will the home buyer receive a copy of the appraiser appraisal and uh, it's it's yes there's some other information down here that you can read if you want to get in the in the weeds about why and how um, all of that but of course yes they're going to receive a copy of that appraisal and this is all from uh, NAR uh, information. If you've ever, if you ever go to their site and look at their research stuff, one of the questions we get here is: Is it okay to talk to the appraiser? Does anyone have a, an opinion on that? Yes, it's okay. Is there? Is it okay to meet the appraiser if you're the listing agent? Yes, it's best to. Is there anything that you would give the appraiser while you're there meeting with that appraiser? Yes, a copy of the CMA, <laughs> a thumb drive with a lot of information. And how many offers you got, the range of offers. I love it. I love it. Susan's got a process, I think. I think we, we may need to see her slides on, on that uh, process. <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly right. You know, you can talk to the appraiser. You can uh, meet with the appraiser. And like everyone said on this call, we strongly recommend it if you're the listing agent. Um, and so NAR uh, report says, you know, pre prepare an appraiser's package. And I'll show you. That's one of the downloads we're going to give you today as part of this class. Uh, it, it's actually a, a really um, easy to use document to do this, but um, you know, this one says it can include plats, surveys, deeds, covenants, HOA docs, floor plans, inspection reports, on and on and on, upgrades, remodels, all of that stuff. We'll kind of show you the format we have. You're welcome to do whatever you want to um, with that form and, and expand on it if you want. And then the next thing here, can I speak to the appraiser? You know, yes, right? Um, uh, and then what can be done if the fee appraisal is inaccurate? We'll talk about that. Is the appraiser required to review the purchase contract? Yes, uh, is the answer there. Uh, I think there was one more on here we wanted to highlight. Okay, does a buyer's choice of financing impact the appraisal process? Yes, appraiser must comply with the uh, USPAP uh, appraisal regulations that they have based on the mortgage lender, FHA, USDA, VA. Some loans will require the property to meet certain minimum property requirements. So you and the appraiser, we just we just hit on it. Uh, you know, feel the communication from the appraisal. A lot of times, what will happen is obviously the property is under contract. Appraiser has been notified. It's been scheduled from the funding institution to the appraiser to hey, reach out to the listing agent, schedule the appraisal. Um, you know, let them know you'll let them in the home, right? Because a lot of times they'll ask, oh, is there a lockbox on the property? Can you send me the CBS code to get in that property? Or they have an e key to get in. Um, and you'll just say, yes, what time will you be there? Great. Uh, you know, I'll meet you there. Um, then you're at the appraisal and you're going to give them the um, package uh, that we are going to look at um, to do there and answer any questions. Obviously, the key there is to go to the appraisal. Some tips for you, for your sellers to be able to, uh, you know, let them know how to how to get ready is you want it in show ready condition, right? Um, obviously, the buyer loved it. Uh, the due diligence period is is, is probably done and gone if there were a due diligence period. Now they have an appraisal um, contingency in place, most likely. And so uh, the appraiser doesn't need to walk into a property that does not look like what the MLS pictures look like. Now it doesn't have to be exactly like that. Maybe for the MLS pictures, everything was off the kitchen countertops, right? Coffee maker, everything. It looked like maybe nobody even lived in there, looked like a hotel. It doesn't necessarily have to be to that level, uh, but you still want to have it clean and good condition. And so this is a conversation you're having with the seller of, you know, we want this in a, in a great, great condition and, and really show ready condition, if at all possible. If there are multiple offers, like Susan said, we're letting them know that we're going to give the appraiser a little space. You know, we're going to be there. Hey, I'm here. If you have any questions, you'll give them the appraisal package um, and then, you know, giving them some space. Not that we need to, to review that, but that's in there. If uh, if it is low, right, if the appraisal came, comes back low, the seller's options are to agree to drop the price if the other side, which they should, send over a, a reduction of sales price a, a, a amendment. Um, they can agree, they can negotiate or, or go back on market, right, like agree not to, not to drop the price. And we'll talk about that. Um, and then if you did have to do a reconsideration of value, the appraisal came in. Um, the other side shared the report with you because it says it's 20 grand below. You see in there that they didn't calculate an extra 300 square feet or some error, you know, like that, that would have uh, would have had a, a lot of value. Um, you have really one shot. So don't get hasty and call the appraiser and say, I'm sending you over three comps. 
time out, just take a deep breath because you really have one chance to go do that. Um, what you'll want to do is have your ducks in a row, have all of your comps, have all of the information that really is going to prove what was wrong on that, on that appraisal. And if it's something easy like square footage, then that's an easy one, right? Here's the tax records. Here's all of the info for that property. But if it's something a little more tricky that you notice on there, maybe they used a comp that um, was really outdated and, and maybe it only had a few pictures on MLS, but you know that property because you talked to your seller about it. That may be something a little more involved that you'll have to actually put you know, on paper to show them why um, the value of that property is actually higher the uh, appraisal package that we talked about. Well, here's the summary sheet that we're gonna provide for you. You'll be able to go in and type in any of this information. Um, it will all be anywhere that you see specifics on this page will just be a gray box when you get your document. And so that way you'll say appraisal sheet for your property. Um, you'll be able to go in and use this. If you have something you already have that you like, go for it. But this is just here um, if you are starting at zero. And so you'll be able to have this, the details of the property, right? Bed, bath, square footage in the neighborhood. Um, how many days on market. These are, keep in mind, anything on here are things you want to highlight. Um, number of offers is on here, features and upgrades. Um, you've got some comparables. So the real comparables that, that you really use to help, you know, drive the purchase or the uh, pricing of that property. Um, and the great thing about this sheet is you don't want to put this together based on your information that you found, you know, maybe 20 days ago, if you're in the process of it's under contract, you want to go look again. Let me go check and see what the neighbor just put his house on the market, what it's going for, because if it's higher and, and the market's, you know, trending in that direction, that's going to be a good comp for you to be able to use right before the appraiser comes out. Right. So just go back and double check. Hey, is there a great comp that just closed, that just went on the market, that just went under pending that I can call that agent and see if I can get a roundabout, you know, hey, is it more than list price less? Did you have 30 offers? Great. I'm going to put that info in here and let the appraiser know. Um, if it can save them some legwork from having to do that and you have that info, then, then you know, that's only going to benefit your seller in the situation. Um, so your information, obviously down there at the bottom, so they can contact you if there's any questions. Um, and then a copy of the contract. I never think it hurts to at least include, you know, a copy of the first page that shows the contract amount. Let's jump into um, the actual appraiser form. This is a, a deep, deep, deep dive into that property and, and submitting that opinion of value that they come out with. So uh, we're gonna just hit the highlights of what's in here, a refresher if you've seen it before. Um, if you haven't seen it before, we'll, we'll kind of point out a few things in here that uh, you might wanna know um, are in there. This is the first page of where all the info starts to go in. Um, you've got your subject property listed here. They call it a, a 1004 or a URAR, um, and that's the appraisal report if you hear it. It is different for F FHA. Um, that's the 1004 FHA. You've got the subject property. So this is the one that we've been working on all day. Um, our property, we want to be able to find those comparable uh, properties. And this is what the appraiser is going to find on this first page. The next one, there's additional lines for more comparable properties, but let's just stick with this one for a second. Uh, and so this is why it's important, right, to do all of that homework that we did earlier, because if nothing else came on market, if nothing else sold, then hopefully our comparables that we had as number one, best one, number two, number three, hopefully those match up. Because if those match up, we have a pretty good idea um, hopefully of where that value is going to land, right? Because we've done our homework, we've helped the seller price it uh, what we believe is appropriately, and uh, and now the appraiser's coming in, um, hopefully, just to verify that, right? That's that's kind of what we would, would hope would happen in this scenario. You've got down here a lot of different things, right? Uh, you can see all of the, the different categories and things that go into um, this appraisal report, starting with and, and we're not going to hit all of these, but we're just going to touch on a few of them. You know, you've got the sales price of, of the properties, right? So your subject and then and then the comparables. Um, you have the sales price divided by the gross living area. So there's that price per square foot we kind of looked at when we were looking in the matrix um, situation. You've got uh, the sale or financing concessions. So if there were any uh, closing costs paid by the seller, um, was it FHA, where is it conventional? And you can see that in, in, in matrix, you know, when you're going through the property in that bottom right, uh, once the property is, has closed, you'll be able to see that. Uh, the view, uh, you know, so view is on here. The site is on here. Quality of construction, the condition of the actual property. So different than the quality of construction, right? And then you've got above grade room count with the gross living area and finished uh, basement rooms below. And then the garage, you've got a porch, energy heating, 
uh, functional utility. I mean, things on here that they spend a lot of time uh, to, to go through to be able to get to a point where they're doing a lot of appraisals. And um, this is one of the reasons why, right? Like all of this information here uh, would make my head spin if I had to do this for every listing that we, you know, tried to put in, right? I mean, this is, a, this is a lot of information. We look at it from the marketability, from the big standpoint, like we looked at earlier, they're looking at it just super granular, you know, uh, definitely, you know, splitting hairs when it comes down to this. Does anyone know that technical, you know, appraisal definition of, of how they consider it below grade or above grade? If any wall has soil next to it, it is considered below grade. Yeah, the, the, I think the one of the appraisers said something like, um, "If you can stand on that floor, and if you walk, if you could walk out, like there may not be a door, but if you could walk out and you couldn't walk out flat, you know, of any of those walls that are surrounding that uh, that floor, then it's going to be considered below grade because that means that there's earth, you know, a foot, five feet, ten feet, whatever it is, up on any one of those walls, right, Susan? So." That's exactly what you're talking about. The, the reason that's a big deal and the reason that they, you know, the, the appraisers have it listed here is because they assign different value. You could have a, a basement that on one side of the wall has, you know, five feet of earth, right, uh, of just one wall. And then you could have the main floor. They could look the same. They could be the same quality of construction, um, you know, all the same, um, really everything. If it's a typical home, uh, then they're going to give a lot less value to that basement floor, even if it's finished out the same. Now they're going to give a high level of value because it's finished a high quality versus the comparables, uh, but it's not going to be equal to the main the main floor. Um, the only explanation I've ever heard is that it's more from a utility function. Somebody walks in, you know, main level of a house. Typically, that's where they're going to spend most of their time, and so that's where the value is for that property. Um, and, and so then, if they have to go down the stairs or somewhere else to another floor, or have to go outside to get into that floor, um, that's one of the utility function devalues of of that from uh, the appraiser. So this these are some notes that um, that I had from an, from a, a previous DS Murphy. Uh, class is that they may call the pen, pending listings and a lot of times they do right so when they're looking at their comps and they see a listing that's pending um, they'll reach out to the agent you may have received or fielded a, a call from um, an appraiser saying hey I'm an appraiser with this company I see you had this listing you know can you tell me a little bit about it or they may come out and, and ask you know um, how many contracts you had you know was it above or, or whatever pricing and try to get that um, info from you uh, this is the statement that they said in that class is, can you convey that it's under contract at or near list price? And so that's kind of the question they lead into to, to that. Um, again, they will start on the same side of the street, like we looked at on our uh, example. Um, and then they'll go to the elementary school, you know, as they get that bigger and bigger zones, um, the elementary school, then middle school, then high school, if they have to go that route. And then the GLA we looked at on that last uh, sheet, it is the gross living area above grade. Um, and the info from that class, the appraiser said that they do not typically look for um, in the records for permits on the actual basement. Now, that doesn't mean they won't. That doesn't mean it won't come up in a, in a listing that you have, um, but that was some information from them. And then uh, they will do what we looked at. We start at quarter mile, half mile, one mile out of that property. Um, if we have to go outside of, of either that neighborhood or, or we're just not starting in a neighborhood um, to begin with. Something that DS Murphy offers. This is really for that, probably a rare circumstance that you'll run across, but if you do all of your homework from what we did in the beginning and say you found one comparable and you went out a mile, you went 12 months back, you did everything you could to try to find a comp for that property, but it was a very unique property. Um, you know, something about that property just made it so, so special that there's nothing else that you could find to even compare it to. Um, DS Murphy offers what's called a pre-appraisal. They call it a consultation appraisal. It's 450 bucks. That was the number last I checked. It may be a little bit more than that, but you can order it um, at their website. It's academyofrealestate.us slash consultation. And what they'll do um, is they'll come out and actually pre-appraise that property before it goes to market, right? The, the best case scenario is you're using it for that unique property. You're using it for something you can't find comps for. You can't really put a price on it. It's a one of a kind type property, um, you know, 25 acres with, with, you know, um, three different homes located on it and a moat around it or something, you know, something that you just absolutely couldn't put a value on. I would definitely talk to my seller about, listen, $450 in the realm of things 
is going to be well worth it. Uh, if we go and, and, and get an actual price from an appraiser, it's confidential to the seller and the rebuttal uh, of this is handled at no charge. And so we'll look at uh, what that looks like. So DS Murphy essentially comes out, writes a pre-appraisal. It looks just like the appraisal. The seller uh, you know, pays for it. It's the seller's appraisal. And so now they have a value. So say that you know, unique property we, we talked about um, comes back at $600,000 for the entire property. That's what's on the appraisal from DS Murphy. You uh, market the property and say um, you market it at $600,000. It goes under contract at 600. And then the appraisal for the buyer comes in at 580. And so you have the pre-appraisal at 600. That's what you listed it at. That's what it was under contract. And the appraisal from the buyer at the end, you know, comes in. And so they'll actually handle uh, that rebuttal at no charge. And they'll essentially talk to that appraisal appraiser uh, about why that property is worth 600 grand. And this is just a little write up about, you know, what that includes. You can find it on their website. And, uh, and yeah, I think that's a, a really good scenario if you, if you have that type of property. So we talked at the beginning of class about the Zestimate, you know, Zillow said my house was worth what, or said your house was worth what. Um, and so this is a comparison. So this is one property. I'm, I'm not going to put the actual address up there, but one property and, and Penny Mac is, a, is an online valuation tool. Obviously Zillow, we know that. There's Redfin's number. So this is the exact same property, okay? And then there's Real AVM. That's the one we were talking about that's in your uh, MLS matrix search, you know, on that tax tab. And so uh, this property was actually listed at 695 and under contract there. But you can see the varying differences here, right? There's a 60K difference between what you would see if you went on this property to real AVM and what this estimate says, um, I mean, that's a big range. Now it was listed at 695 in this market, it might go for 750 and that might be the completed price that it happens at. But if you just took a regular market and you just pulled these, these numbers up, uh, this is the one that typically your clients are going to say, well, the Zillow says my home is worth this amount. Right. And so you can, you, what I would do if I were, if I were you and they said that, and they were really, you know, hard set on, on that being the number, just pull their property up um, on Google and it, all of these sites will pop up, right? It just, it, it knows it's like, oh, it's a property. And you click on these like Redfin and, and in your real ABM and show them those and say, well, I know you think it's 750. This site thinks it's 690 or whatever it ends up being, right? And, um, uh, you know, why do you want to go with that one? Just because it's the highest? Well, of course, right? But that's where you as the experienced agent coming in, uh, you know, bringing the actual comparable properties um, for them comes into play, analyzing the pictures um, and, and going through that, uh, that part of it. Thank you for being here.